Thank you uh, to Dr. Shailesh Upredi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. If, if I'm not, please, please correct me now. Dr. Upredi has worked well over a decade here doing research in Binghamton University, uh, being mentored by uh, Dr. Stanley Whittingham, who won the uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry a few years back for his uh, not just inventing lithium ion batteries, but also his ongoing research and his leadership at uh, Binghamton Re University's research center uh, devoted, it's the center of excellence uh, on uh, energy. And uh, they, they focus on uh, battery storage uh, is, is a big part of what they're doing. Uh, so Dr. Rupretti is the founder of C4V, which holds the uh, the intellectual property, in other words, the patents on the, the new technology that he has uh, helped uh, develop. And um, he has organized this new company called Imperium 3 New York. Uh, their acronym is IM3NY. And this is a brand new startup business that's a spinoff from that research at Binghamton University. It's a new lithium ion battery manufacturing business business uh, with cutting edge research from Binghamton University. Uh, that's the, the underpinning of it. And they're setting up a, a manufacturing line in the Huron campus, which is most people know it as the old IBM complex. So there's very little I IBM left there, but uh, as if, I think probably 500 IBM people may be left. Um, but anyway, this new lithium ion uh, battery uh, technology, the I IM3 NY will be producing, will help enable the transition to renewable energy economy. And in turn, that will help save a habitable climate. Uh, and that's really super important. Um, and one of the things that really caught my eye is that uh, the, the, the company is claiming that they can produce batteries with ultra rapid charge capability. They can charge to 85% of their their charge capacity in six minutes. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing Dr. Rupretti talk about this. And uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rupretti. Uh, I, I turn the, the presentation over to you now and, and uh, uh, go ahead. And let's ask Dr. Rupretti how he wants questions handled. You want people to just to voice them up or you want to have them wait? No, no, I think I think we can go uh, as I present. I think that will probably make it more interactive. So uh, I'll try to go slow and then take questions, uh, you know, as and when they come. Is, would that be okay? That's sure. fine. Excellent. Share my screen. And we are a little bit, I think, having a little glitch in terms of screen sharing. Uh, I have my colleague here. Paul Stratton. So I'll probably make him a co-host uh, so we can, oh, is that I possible? can do that. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Also, Paul is the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for IM3NY. He's been very gracious and, and very helpful in communicating with me and, uh, uh, you know, we're, we've worked out a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, difficulties, and uh, we issued a correction in our our press release also. And uh, I apologize again for getting that wrong. We should have reviewed that with Dr. Rupretti before we put it out, but in the end, I think it turned out well. And yeah, uh, all good, no worries. Okay, thank you. So I, I'll turn my screen so you can also see Paul on my screen, but uh, we'll be doing the screen share through his computer. Sorry, we're having just a little bit of technical trouble here. Sorry about that. Maybe in the interim, what we can do is just have Dr. Upretti uh, yeah, give us me, a little background. Yeah, let me talk about a little bit of my background and, and the company uh, while he's pulling up the presentation. So uh, originally, I, I'm, I'm from India. I came over here. Actually, before that, I graduated from one of the top schools in India called IIT. And IIT Delhi uh, is the place where I got into, you know, into lithium and battery through my professor advisor there. And that advisor actually graduated from Binghamton University a couple of decades back. And he was the first student of Professor Stan Whittingham. So that's how I consider myself the third generation in lithium and batteries. And uh, 
really got uh, good knowledge from Professor, Professor Ramanan in India, then uh, came over here uh, in Binghamton around 2006. So it's been about 15, 16 years now. And uh, first worked with Professor Sam Whittingham, uh, then moved to industry for a few years and became an entrepreneur. So last 10 to 12 years, you know, I've been uh, uh, mostly trying to develop new products, bring uh, new technologies to market uh, around lithium and batteries. So as we all know, Professor Stan Whittingham, who is also a senior professor at Binghamton University, invented the first lithium ion battery and also won the Nobel Prize in 2019. So that really um, got uh, you know, this whole community. I mean, I would say there are many students who graduated from his group and some of them stayed behind. And I think a lot of uh, knowledge that exists in and around this area. And I'm among one of the students uh, you know, that decided to develop this technology and eventually commercialize uh, locally. Um, so, yeah, uh, sorry, was there a question or something? Sorry. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so, uh, you know, in 2011, 12, I would say primarily early part of 2012, when we started uh, protecting our IP through patent filing. So first patent was filed in, in February, 2012. And since then we have been, uh, you know, filing a lot of uh, patents, uh, mostly around the molecules that go in a lithium ion battery um, and a lithium ion battery cell, more specific to. And these are the molecules that eventually store energy. You know, when, when for example, when we use uh, uh, a phone or, or now electric cars or solar, when these molecules primarily drive the key performance, whether the energy storage capacity, the safety, the cost, and, and there are four components that play a key role in that. And that's where majority of the uh, work happening today globally. And we are very proud in saying that we are going to be, and as soon as we are in production in a few months, we are going to be the largest homegrown uh, gigafactory, we call it. So gigafactory, typically a term given to uh, a factory that can produce uh, about one gigawatt hour minimum amount of cells and batteries uh, annually. So, um, so that's kind of, you know, uh, we take pride in saying so because uh, it takes it takes decade to two decade to build that infrastructure. So it has taken us almost uh, nine years to where we are and still, uh, you know, it's, it's the beginning of the journey. And our goal is to not stop here, you know, with one gigawatt hour that we are setting up now, we literally looking at scaling it to 32 to eventually 50 gigawatt hour. But I think what is more important and uh, maybe relevant to this audience is the way we develop these technologies and also the, uh, the environmental uh, aspect of these uh, batteries, whether, it, whether you know, before production, during production and post production. Um, and that's really you know, what differentiates us. We have uh, looked into the, the molecule that will go inside, but also where the actual raw materials come from, uh, what different processes these companies use, our, our suppliers primarily, and are they green? Are they using green processes? Are they using green energy? And, uh, and then eventually we want to do the same. And then when we hand it over to an electric car manufacturer or a, 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 a solar or wind company, uh, we are hoping that you know, this, this whole chain will be passed on to the next uh, you know, entity in the value chain. And as a result, we will create a, a greener earth, cleaner and greener to our next generation uh, and generations to come. So that's really the bigger vision. You know, obviously we want to first build the business and make sure that we are stable in business, but that's always for a short term. The bigger vision is if we can't produce these batteries by greener mean and can't make our mother nature much greener, you know, much cleaner, then it really defeats our vision and purpose. So while we want to bring these new technologies, I think we are very, very conscious and we, we want to really set the milestone. Today, there is a third party evaluation done or, on our batteries where New York State and Nyserda actually hired a third party company to look into the greener and toxic footprint and the carbon footprint. And we turn out to be you know, one of the, uh, the best in the industry. 
And I think that's that's the legacy we want to carry as we you know set up this first line. Then eventually you know more uh, production uh, lines that will be built here in 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 Endicott. So uh, you know it looks like we we uh, we are now good to go with our presentation. And I really want to thank uh, you know for for to the entire Sierra Club for inviting us today. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I saw some new members joined in. So we would be happy to take questions as we go through the slides. So feel free to, uh, to stop and, and ask questions. Um, as you can see from the first slide, you know, we're literally looking at high performance, safe, reliable lithium and battery technologies. And performance for us is not just the energy density cycle life, is the greener aspect also included, how green these batteries are going to be. And obviously we want to be, we want to make sure that they are safe. So here is the quick outline of the uh, slide deck that I'm going to present today. And we'll start with the company overview. I gave you like 30,000 feet overview. Maybe I'll touch upon some more points. Uh, then the technology, which we have built in last 10 years and we'll continue to build hopefully for many decades to come. And, and then, you know, the Giga factory, which is primarily the factory we are uh, setting up in Endicott, New York, um, the birthplace of IBM and really hoping to transform uh, not only the region, but the whole global industry and lead this uh, cell manufacturing that we believe are, are already running at the forefront of the green manufacturing. So uh, with that, um, let me go through the company's uh, mission. Uh, as we know, uh, you know, batteries are already now kind of becoming part of our day-to-day -day life. Uh, it started from cell phone, laptops, and you know computers. Now electric cars and solar and wind. So it's, it's the, the horizon is increasing, and and we really want to set a new trend in how that horizon expanded, and how we transition from one old coal based or or diesel based industry to new green and you know clean uh, industry. So really, we want to be part of that transition. Uh, and really become a, a leader in that and bring the key, clean energy now and, and for many, many cycles, life cycles, we call it. So uh, that is our vision. And with that, uh, here is the quick summary, how we started, as you can see the, the left uh, bottom, uh, you know, the R&D center, which is a part of the Binghamton University's uh, center of excellence, also Stan Whittingham's laboratory. And that's where uh, CFUV was formed. Um, we we uh, started our work in early 2012. And uh, throughout that, as you also uh, may observe uh, me standing uh, with two of the Nobel laureates, Professor Stan Whittingham and uh, Professor John Goodenough, uh, who have been role model for, for someone like me uh, to really uh, not only build the technology, but look into how the technology can impact the, 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 the social aspect and the society in general. Uh, we also in 2020 revealed our first uh, product in, a, we call it commercial product, although we have built many uh, other products in past that are the mini version of the same. Um, and this uh, product is the one that will also produce from our Endicott facility. And along the way, we have uh, been part, integral part of the community here, whether it's, uh, you know, um, when uh, the governor of New York came to inaugurate our project or throughout the NYSERDA's different plans and programs in, in, in this region, uh, including 76 West. And also, uh, you know, the, the more announcement and more social events and, and community events and gatherings we have done. Uh, and now we are uh, literally looking at uh, starting our production uh, very soon in 2020. Uh, and that will be our first uh, Gigafactory site, uh, which is what we are anticipating that uh, will be live, uh, you know, early part of uh, 2020. And uh, you know, really, the vision for us is to take that product and and uh, get into global dominance of the battery supply. So uh, you probably see the last picture uh, is, is the uh, indication of how we are looking at expanding this business globally um, from the production we do in in, in Endicott. Next slide. So some of the key highlights. Um, and you know the, these uh, maybe the fonts are smaller uh, for for the audience 
uh, that is looking at the smaller screen, but I'll try to highlight the key points here. So what we have really uh, built together uh, as we continue to make our journey from R&D to manufacturing is, is, is uh, build a strong team, which is backed by uh, very strong strategic partners and investors. Also the technology that uh, not only the in-house we have developed, but the partnership we bring through universities, national labs, and, and uh, you know, award-winning uh, winning cell chemistry. Uh, we in fact call this a, a platform, not just technology or a product, because we anticipate there'll be many more sub products and main products that will be coming off this uh, specific chemistry. We also have a cutting edge uh, tech built in-house that uh, kind of takes us through different stages of product development, but also uh, you know, future technologies like holy grail of batteries, including solid state. We do anticipate that our factory will eventually be a vertically integrated uh, design where a lot of our suppliers some uh, upstream and some of our customer downstream would like to co-locate and that will eventually lead to an ecosystem or industrial cluster in, in Southern tier region. Uh, a robust uh, product development and innovation capabilities that are part of our DNA uh, will continue to grow in, in different directions, not just at the molecular level, but hopefully you know, in processes in designs and eventually components and products that uh, a common man uh, would be able to see in, in, in their devices, uh, including like electric car and solar and wind. Uh, we also uh, are uh, really focusing on the global uh, market and the emerging markets. And, uh, you know, EVs, EV adoption could take a while uh, globally, uh, not only, you know, just in the US, there are many challenges with the infrastructure, the cost, uh, but there are many uh, other, you know, industries that include solar, wind, but, uh, you know, some of them also utilize uh, power tools and, and some of them use, uh, you know, robotics, uh, forklifts, uh, you know, mining equipment, uh, cell towers, data centers. And uh, the beauty of our chemistry is it, it can actually address the need uh, of different verticals. Next slide. So, uh, you know, as we all know, team is very, very important to, to pull through any project. And this is really the massive and, and a very heavy undertaking. And, and as we make it uh, happen right here in Endicott, uh, we have built a very strong team that is led by Chaitanya Sharma. He, he's the ex-Tesla who was the first engineer hired by Tesla to build a gigafactory in Nevada. And uh, along with him is the uh, top uh, management here. Bill Shannon, that comes with 25 years uh, plus of experience. Duracell HNT, that has been leader in, in uh, many different products, but you know some high precision metal parts and components used. Uh, in his previous role, he was managing six factories globally. He was part of uh, several factories from ground up, uh, including the one they had to build inside the Tesla Giga factory. Then uh, Priyadarshi Panda, who has a 15 plus year of experience in, in machine building, uh, machine integration, designs, uh, data analytics. Uh, he's an MIT uh, graduate, had worked with LAM research, applied materials, Intel. Uh, then Paul um, uh, Stratton, who is with me here today right now, and we'll be joined by Chetanya also actually later on. Um, any questions that are related to our permits and chemicals, so we can call him in to, to answer those. Uh, but uh, he, he will be joining us in a while, uh, but Paul, as he brings uh, extensive uh, sales and marketing experience, the leadership experience uh, of that uh, 18 plus year in lithium and batteries is amazing. And uh, he has been a, a key uh, member for team, uh, acting as a bridge between the community, customer, vendors, you know, it's a, um, it's a role that he has taken really well. And, and uh, you know, I think we're very happy to have him on our team. Then Brandon, um, who comes with the, again, extensive hardware development, uh, data analysis, process control, is uh, going to be the senior process, you know, director for engineering. And uh, this team is supplemented by a, a, a world leading um, board, as you may uh, see in the next slide. Um, I think we're having some difficulty moving the slides here, but uh, really uh, along with me on the board, we have, uh, experts like uh, Frank, uh, who comes with an extensive mining background, 
We also have uh, Mona Dazani. She is one of the senior partner in a law firm, but also has extensive uh, uh, you know, background in clean and green energy. She has been advocate um, of, of uh, clean energy as well as uh, you know, not only batteries, but you know, fuel cell, et cetera, as well. And then Mike Driscoll, who is uh, also our CFO uh, right now, and uh, he has been a part of the local community. He lives in, in, in uh, Ithaca. Uh, but uh, he he has taken companies from startup to all the way IPOs. He has spent many years here. He was in fact the CEO of uh, uh, I think Smith Corona, and then eventually you know built factories in Asia and, and built companies, and now uh, has taken a very important role in our team and uh, really been part of all the uh, uh, financing and uh, you know funding related activities. Uh, this uh, next slide is about our um, uh, technology, uh, the um, cutting us technology that we have built. Uh, give us a second. I think we're having a little bit of difficulty again. Uh, in this is the Paul slide. Stratton. I'm, I'm the one having troubles. I think I've overworked my uh, computer and it's giving me a little trouble here. So apologies to Shalesh and we'll get this cat caught up in just a second. Yeah, so, uh, so this one is uh, about our first uh, series of product. We call it P-series, uh, uh, which stands for phosphate series, a cobalt and nickel-free chemistry. There are primarily two chemistries. One is LFP and the other is NMC uh, that dominate the global market today, whether you buy uh, a cell phone or, or an electric car from Tesla, the same families of materials used in, in these batteries. And uh, we have come up with a new chemistry that uh, we believe brings the best of both world, but in a much greener and cheaper way. Uh, cheaper, I mean, the production cost and the cost associated with the processes and the raw material. And, and uh, there is a comparison on the right-hand side top picture that shows in a, in a hexagon, the green uh, portion of uh, the green lines represent BMLMP, which is our chemistry. And uh, uh, this, this molecule that we invented had gone through various development cycles. Not only we, we released and built our you know, commercial uh, cell um, early part of this year, but uh, these products are already in use by one of our customer, Martech, uh, that builds autonomous electric boats for uh, US Navy and, and Royal Navy and, and some other uh, you know, applications in, in defense market. Uh, now that uh, whole uh, test of molecule, test of product is now going through a uh, large scale manufacturing process in Endicott. So uh, you see a representation of the, the factory that uh, we deassembled earlier and moved to, to Endicott. Uh, so we'll be rebuilding this, these, all these machinery you see um, on this uh, slide here. I'm giving a pause if anyone wants to ask any question on technology, then I'll, I'll move to the next part of the, uh, still I'm, I'm going to talk more about the tech, but uh, um, any questions I'll, I'll give. Yes, uh, Dr. Rupreti, you early on you mentioned that you were thinking of starting production, and I think you misspoke, you said 2020. You're, I think you're actually going to start yes. in early 2022, isn't that true? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, just, yeah. I just wanted to mention that in case somebody in the audience is, is you know, wanting to ask that question and they're, they're too shy to ask it. Yeah. I have true. a question. Uh, I is, the, about uh, all about it, honey. is the building in Endicott uh, uh, going to be reused or is it new construction? No, we are using an existing building. Uh, Thank so you. Yes. I forgot all about it. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry, honey, I forgot all about it. <laughs> I'm going to have to mute you, Cindy. We'll, we'll take care of that. Hold on. Uh, okay, sorry about that. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, Shalish, uh, what is the significance of not needing cobalt? That's a pretty big deal, am I right? It is. So if we look at it from multiple angles, so let's first talk about the safety side and the toxic carbon footprint. So cobalt-based uh, chemistries are inherently not very safe. 
That's uh, they they uh, they are uh, you know the because of the oxide matrix uh, they easy to catch fire. So safety is 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 very uh, very low. I mean the lowest among all the chemistries. The cobalt rich has the lowest safety. Uh, the other angle is a majority of this cobalt is coming from DRC, Congo. Almost 60% of the global sub cobalt supply is there. And there have been many articles in, uh, you know, Bloomberg, Washington Post that has spoken about how, uh, you know, ch even child labor is involved, but uh, very unethical practices in the mining processes used in cobalt. So, so there are many other uh, elements that you know don't make it very attractive for scale up mm -hmm. and and uh, really be a part of the transition of the green industry. Um, and the second is the and the third is the cost. You know, it's uh, among these obviously because of the limited resources and higher you know demand than supply. The cost has gone crazy last four years. I would say the cost has increased at least twice or you know three times um, and that's that's not good. So uh, uh, then we are not even at the early phase of the growth. Uh, so if we need to scale this industry, the cobalt is probably not the right, uh, you know, metal to, to build the industry around. It certainly has cert some benefits like the volumetric energy density uh, you get, you know, with the cobalt is also the best among all. Uh, however, you know, that should not, be the only matrix to use it. Uh, so that's why, you know, we decided to, to develop this chemistry that is uh, cobalt free. And similar story with nickel as well. Nickel, although has, um, you know, larger results, it doesn't have, you can also probably do ethical mining and, and source it, but still quite expensive. And safety wise, it's not, uh, you know, any better than uh, cobalt. So ha not having both of them really give us some, uh, Good advantage on the safety side. Better get Thomas in too. Okay, so I'll I'll continue and uh, with this chemistry which we call BM LMP. Primarily, it's a biomineralized lithium phosphate. Uh, has a very strong energy density, good cycle life, also a very high reliability because as we go from one cell to thousands of cells and also um, use one versus 500 in electric car. Uh, reliability is very, very important. And that reliability comes from the performance, the safety, you know, all the different uh, aspect of the uh, battery that, uh, you know, in terms of the performance it has to deliver and the consistency it has to deliver from one batch to the batch or from one cell and one battery to other. Um, the safety uh, I, I spoke about, so I won't uh, go into it in detail, but you know the, the risk of thermal runaway is minimal with us because we, we do not use you know free oxygen or oxygen rich chemistry and that really inhibit you know a lot of these thermal runaway situations. And uh, of course, uh, you know not the I mean, last but not the least is the cost. Uh, in order for uh, these products, uh, you know most importantly the electric car and, and have it affordable, uh, cost of battery is going to be very, very important. Uh, almost 40 to 50% of the cost of the car is batteries today. So as we reduce that cost, it's going to make these vehicles, the solar, wind, more affordable to, uh, to the consumers. So, so that these four key elements really uh, add up to the, the benefit so, that we can deliver. You've got you know, your, your recent calls to you know, yeah, I did that. Uh, oh, in I that. think uh, I thought there is a question, but uh, looks like uh, there's some background noise. I'm going to ask whoever is doing it to please mute. I'm not sure. I think Scott uh, says Scott. Uh, no, that's that's me. <laughs> Scott, okay. I can, because I can't see the picture on the screen. Yeah. Well, I think I think we're good now. Okay. Okay. I think we're having a difficulty with our screen again, but um, if if you've got a delay for slides, can you uh, address whether there's a trade-off if uh, if you charge to 
85% capacity in six minutes with the, with these uh, battery cells that you're going to be producing? Uh, do you lose significant uh, uh, life cycle in terms of charging? They, they lick each other's um, ears. They sleep in the same place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I think he's probably got the same. Julian is, you need to mute, mute Julian. Yeah. Okay. All right. Dr. Rupetti, did you hear my question? Yes, I did. I did uh, understand your question. Okay, and, uh, thank you. So uh, basically, um, uh, in terms of the you know design, we are developing that you know two ways we are doing it. Right, one uh, is for the energy market where we uh, basically focus on the energy density and uh, you know overall how um, safe uh, these. Um, Battery is going to be and and you know really make them affordable. That's our phase one plan. Then in parallel, what we are doing is uh, also make these batteries uh, capable of uh, you know charging faster. So what that means is uh, as the infrastructure get built, because you know fast charge also has its own challenges. How would the grid infrastructure support that? How much you know power uh, or the current that we need? So uh, really what we are looking at is by the time the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure, which, we, which is uh, primarily uh, you know, uh, the charging stations and other ancillary uh, services that complement charging gets developed, how we can make uh, the transition very smooth you know, to the next phase of charging network, which will be uh, you know, um, supporting with the smaller size battery uh, probably, and, but, but uh, charge them faster. So, uh, so one of this technology that we have been working on, and uh, you know, it has been part of our development for last, uh, uh, you know, many, uh, I would say, two years minimum, and uh, you know, that's uh, so uh, that's where we have, what we have done is come up with a kind of a recipe. It's the same design, same raw material. We don't change anything, uh, but the recipe changed where uh, we can you know, um, build a cell or the battery cell, we call it, that can be charged in six minutes. You know, right now we are somewhere in 10 minutes. We're not yet six, but you know, it's leapfrog from where the industry today to 10 minutes. Uh, but I think we are very close to going to six minutes as well. All right. And uh, so, um, so that... Um, and before you finish, would that translate to be 10 minutes at electric vehicle level, like at car level, would it still be 10 minutes? That's correct. So it will be- um, Wow. I mean- It will be 10 minutes because from cell to pack, I mean, eventually our goal is six minutes. So okay. we will deliver a, a six minute battery charge without sacrificing the energy. I think that's what your main question was. I couldn't complete the response. So I think you were asking if you go from zero to 85 or 90 or 100 percent, are you going to sacrifice on energy density? So the answer is we will, but but not more than five percent. Uh, you know, so we will still have the same energy density and and, and charge in in ten uh, eventually six minutes. And, and life cycle would it still be good enough for electric vehicles to last perhaps a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand miles? Do you think? Uh, yes. So. The life cycle is another work that we are right now, uh, you know, devoting a lot of time. And, and the reason life cycle is very important for fast charge is as the fast charge battery comes to the market, it, it will be charged more frequently. So the goal here is really to make the vehicle affordable. Today, the battery is, you know, 100 kilowatt hour. So the cost is almost 50% of the car cost is the battery itself. So if you can reduce the battery size to 50% or 25%, then the vehicle cost will also go down. You will have a lighter bat battery in your vehicle. You'll have more space to use and less weight to carry. Uh, but the other challenge will you'll have to charge it more frequently. And, and that's something uh, with the fast charge can be achieved, but it defeats the purpose if it, you cannot get the say, you know, better cycle life. So battery cycle life actually our goal is to double or triple it from where it is today. So make it fast charge, but also give it you know three times more uh, life is the goal. So we have been able to achieve good cycle life so far. We have tested around 4,000 cycles 
that equates to you know if you do a single charge every day that equates to around 10 year life 11 year life cycle so so we'll continue to improve it so that that's i hope the audience realizes that what dr repretti just said is a big deal it really is that's a big <laughs> deal if you can get charging an electric vehicle even down to 10 minutes to say it's 85%, not 100% charge, that and not significantly affect the lifespan of the vehicle in terms of the number of charging cycles that you would, a, a normal owner would, would uh, put the vehicle through with that battery pack. That is a huge deal. I, I, I want to emphasize this. this. This is a big deal. This is, not, this is not something that you can just gloss over because people have been trying to reduce the charging time. That's one of the key hangups that people have. One is that the, what, what Dr. Perry already mentioned is the lack of enough uh, chargers that, you know, away from home. If you, if, you don't, if you have a home charger, most of your trips will start with a full charge already. But some people live in apartments, they don't have the ability to charge at home. That, that's one hurdle. But the other hurdle that besides cost that Dr. Perry mentioned, which he's already working on getting the cost down, the, the third one, is how fast can you so you know fill up so to speak in other words recharge with with an electric vehicle right now if you go to a, 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 a an internal combustion engine powered car it takes about five ten minutes to fill up depending on whether you've got a, a big uh, fancy pickup truck with you know 70 gallons of uh, gasoline or diesel fuel that you hold or or you have a car that's a 15 gallon tank so if you can get it down to 10 minutes, that eliminates one of the big the, the sticking points that, that consumers, potential consumers have of adopting electric vehicles. So thank you, Dr. Repretti, for answering my questions. I'm sorry to, to keep persisting on this, but I wanted to bring this to people's attention because this is really eye-opening. It's it is a game changer. So thank you. Absolutely. No, I think I'm, I'm glad you asked this because I, I think it's a very important aspect and it is going to increase the EV adoption and also going to make uh, electric vehicle more affordable. Um, and I think the, the, the fear of long term charge uh, and also, you know, the cost is, is definitely one of the one of the hurdles in, in global adoption of the EVs. So we, we, we strongly believe that uh, technology integration in the, in the value chain will uh, certainly bring a lot of uh, these uh, benefits that will catalyze people's decision to adopt the, the cleaner transport. So uh, this particular slide we have put in here is, uh, you know, is our technology roadmap. Uh, you know, while we have the P-series product, as you can uh, see, uh, you know, we, we call it BMLMP, uh, that is, you know, again, although it's a chemistry, but we call it platform because it will deliver many products, including the fast charge that will be uh, mass, you know, we're trying to get it mass production ready, you know, somewhere uh, middle of 2023. Uh, until then we will do various tests. We'll get the supply chain fixed and processes designed in place to make sure that it's uh, by then, you know, uh, ready to be mass produced. And uh, there are other products along the way that we have been working for many years now that include the, uh, the N series, the SP series, which is, you know, semi solid state battery. And then eventually we would like to bring a uh, fully solid state, which is all solid state battery uh, with much higher energy density to market as well. And these are, you know, various milestones that we will be achieving uh, with our product. And while we do these product development, we try to remain in, in close collaboration with the end user or, or the, uh, the vehicle or OEM uh, that is developing it. Uh, because, you know, there are many challenges as the molecules go through this uh, transition from, you know, lab scale to pilot scale to mass production. And we would like to have minimum surprises, um, you know, as that transition happens. So I see a question uh, that has come up. Let me can you read it. Can you elaborate on the biological aspect of your biomineralization cathode manufacturing process? Yes, so biomineralization is not really a process itself. It's, it's a molecule uh, in itself. 
And I'll give you, maybe, maybe I'll try to simplify this by giving this example, how the whole uh, invention started back in 2012. So we were looking at uh, mother nature, right? Mother nature has many surprises, uh, many things that uh, even scientists can't, uh, can't answer today. And we, we started thinking about what could be the battery that mother nature you know, has ever made. And we realized that, you know, human, we, we are the best battery that exists in nature because there are many electrochemical reactions happen in our body, many ionic, you know, balance, uh, we call, you know, iron deficiency or magnesium, calcium. So all that happening in our body is, is very similar to what happens to, um, to, to, you know, what happens inside a lithium ion battery. So we started looking into human body, the physiology and the processes that happen inside us. And we realized that this very specific uh, molecule, it's called hydroxyapatite, uh, which is the bone material, you know, calcium apatite, which is a calcium mineral, uh, plays a very important role. Not only our body, the skeleton is stabilized by hydroxyapatite, but in, a, in the ionic balance, the, the lot of other stability in the system, you know, it happens through that particular molecule. So we were the first one to take that uh, molecule. Obviously, we synthesized it in the lab, and it's very, very economical to make it. And, and, and did some ion exchange where the calcium were replaced with lithium and integrated in the, in the molecular, at the molecular level uh, to the active materials to produce the biomineral compositions. So that's really a good explanation of why we call it biomineral, because there is a biomineral used, although we synthesize it. And the synthesis is very, very economical. Uh, no exotic chemicals used, you know, phosphorus and calcium. You, you add them in the right ratio with the lithium. Uh, this is the most robust, you know, system that, uh, you know, is, is formed. In fact, every possible animal has this molecule in it. So, so it's one of the, one of the most abundant, abundant molecule found in the nature. And, and, and I think we have kind of leveraged that uh, in terms of, you know, understanding its properties and then, you know, making it uh, available uh, uh, in the batteries. We have another question. Doesn't a short charging time means very high current and thus potential overheating? Yes. Uh, so that's what I was explaining earlier. Uh, not only the overheating challenges, but also you would also need to have transmission lines that can, you know, basically supply really high current. So, these are the two challenges, but I think to some extent, uh, this overheating challenge is met by our chemistry simply because we are not using the oxide matrix. So most of the batteries used today in cell phones and laptops, uh, they get hot as you charge and discharge them uh, because they have oxi ox oxide matrix. And that oxide matrix, what that mean is, if for some reason, a lot of heat generated inside, and any short circuit ha any short circuit happens uh, within the within the cell. You don't need any environmental oxygen to catalyze the fire. There's a lot of oxygen in the NMC chemistry that which is nickel manganese cobalt oxide uh, that lead to thermal runaway situation. So chemistry is inherently because of you know the biomineralization. As we know, bones are the last thing that burn. So it's the same thing here. It's the very very you know, stable in the heat and can absorb heat and, you know, doesn't destroy easily. So that's kind of a, you know, hidden kind of technical ability in, in our chemistry that, uh, you know, prohibit it from the uh, uh, superheating or extra heating that uh, typically could incur. But we, we agree, we're not saying it will remain very cool. There will be some heat generated and we are working towards that, how we can, you know, eliminate all those heat release and processes that could also then eventually, you know, could be um, uh, catastrophic in a big battery. So, but inherently because of the safety of our chemistry, I think uh, it, it's doable. I think it, it's not something that is rocket science. We have seen improvements as we uh, refine this further. Uh, in addition to the chemistry, we have been also developing the software, which we call digital DNA. Uh, again, this is built in-house. It's primarily uh, a data analysis, data collection. Um, and what is happening is we have built a smart uh, you know, tool 
that will collect the data throughout the industry. It will even tell which mine and where it is coming from, whether it's green and clean component, and, and can predict the manufacturing, the, the <coughs> daily schedule, the waste. Uh -huh. shared, so a lot of you know smart decision made before the event happened. Uh, so this software going to improve our productivity, productivity of the factory. It, it will also improve the, the maintenance that is required otherwise in the system. And um, uh, and automate the procurement uh, processes and make really factories uh, behave uh, you know in a more smarter way and interact with with the value chain throughout. Uh, we we do have uh, a strong in-house product development capability, uh, not only because of Stan Whittingham's infrastructure and C4V's infrastructure and now IM3's infrastructure, but also we have uh, very advanced uh, uh, collaborations with many academic institutions that include MIT, Cornell, uh, and some national labs like Brookhaven National Lab, Oregon National Lab. So all that academic collaboration with our industry partners and, and our supply chain partners and, and combined with the world-class leaders and the scientists we have, we have in our teams, I think, I think that kind of acts as a triangle that supports the and, and lift our R&D capabilities and really making us one of the most advanced battery uh, technology company in the US, uh, in fact, globally. And with that, we are continuously making improvement uh, in our processes and our battery architecture, the, the designs we are developing and the solid state batteries, and eventually, you know, the test platform uh, that will be developed uh, to really provide robust batteries to, to the end customers and system integrators. There is a question that has come, uh, what type of anode are uh, you using? So today we use a graphite anode. Um, it's a pure graphite, nothing added to it. Uh, and our as we transition from of P series to N series, we 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 starting um, to use a little bit of silicon, and then eventually in solid state uh, we will be uh, uh, a kind of you know metal based, which is uh, anode free design we call it. But literally we, we have to have anode. Uh, it's it's a it's a uh, copper film that we use, which even otherwise we use uh, in our regular anodes where the graphite is coated. So, so that is the anode we'll be using in our solid state. But today it's a, it's a graphite coated on, on uh, copper film. So that uh, completes the two section of my presentation. Um, now I'm moving to the Gigafactory, which uh, primarily talks about uh, the beautiful work the engineering team has been doing inside this building. Uh, but it also reflects our vision, as you can probably see, this is the um, part of building uh, 48 and 53, uh, where we'll be occupying um, around quarter million square feet, but eventually uh, more space. And as we transition from one gigawatt hour to, to 32 gigawatt hour, uh, more building space and other buildings will be occupied and we'll be repurposing a lot of the infrastructure um, available in, in uh, here on campus. Um, and uh, in order for us to really build a smarter next generation of plants and factories, uh, we have done a lot of homework. And after that, uh, you know, the, the manufacturing team has built uh, these six core fundamentals, that is, uh, that is leading to this factory, which is going to be world leading in, in terms of the safety, uh, the ecosystem that we'll be building, which is industrial cluster, the vertical integration that will happen where our, some of our suppliers will be co-locating and digitizing it end to end, you know, uh, where um, a lot of uh, internet, internet of things will enable and make our, our you know, machine smarter, better. So, adopting industry 4.0, uh, automating processes. And then eventually, you know, as the, this whole thing gets built, 
really bring a circular economy uh, to the region and you know have a lot of our upstreams uh, downstream supplier either be part you know part of the region here or or located in the us even today 90 almost 90 percent of our components are coming from us suppliers and we we are the only giga scale factory or we're going to be the only giga scale factory uh, that has no reliance on the chinese supply chain so we're very proud of it it has taken us uh, six plus years to build such a solid supply chain. Uh, just to give an example, it takes us around 18 months to 24 months to qualify one supplier. So, our, you know, very strong supply chain team has really worked uh, uh, very hard to, to build this strong um, uh, local supply chain. And we want this to, to remain the benchmark for the industry. You know, build a model that people see us as a smart uh, giga factory producer and eventually leading to safer, higher quality, lower cost uh, factories that has agility to adopt new te technologies and also bring innovation to the market uh, in a much faster pace and enter market in a timely manner. Uh, if I could ask a question here about the recycling, uh, yeah. how easy, I guess I'll just put it that way, will, will it be to recycle your components? Yeah, a perfect question for the for the right slide. Actually, there is one specific point here. We can see recyclability, uh, where we uh, mentioned that uh, not only greener cells, but almost 99.9% .9 of our components can be can be recycled. So, uh, in general, batteries, uh, you know, majority of the components can be recycled. But more specific to our batteries, where while we were developing these components. We were also looking into the, the future scope of those components and what would happen to them in their second life and whether they can be reused. So part of that process, we qualified uh, at least three recycling companies who can take our batteries in 10 years, 15 years from now, whenever they are available to be recycled and, and, and recycle every single component. So, um, and we also look into their green footprint, you know, how they are doing it, so making sure that out of 20 in the market, we are working with the best recyclers in that sense. And it's, it's a long process. They need to understand what components we use and then accordingly design their processes. So it's a long process for them with, with the hope that in 10 years, 15 years from now, they'll be fully ready to, to capture the value and feed it back in the value chain. Hope, hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's good, thanks. So, uh, I mean, in, in terms of, you know, the, we call it the scorecard of our, our Giga factories, literally comparing what is happening traditionally and, you know, the, the Giga factories be, being built today, at least 40 to 50 Giga factories are being built globally. And we call them brand new old factories because they're pretty much duplicating what, you know, was invented 20 years back and scaling a very low efficiency factory. And that's not really the right approach because industry is moving very fast. So people not really looking into the fundamentals. However, we had the agility being a startup to look into everything from ground up and see what we can do better and how we can do it better. And, and then, and that has led to this, you know, uh, smart factory that we have built. So from the cost associated upfront cost to the manufacturing cost uh, and the uh, overall process optimization, the future proof of these factories, because as the next generation technology comes online, um, we need to make sure that our next generation of product can be integrated. We're also looking into the North American ecosystem as there is heavy reliance in the Asian import today. Uh, we need to get out of that. Otherwise scaling electric cars or solar and wind going to be very, very challenging just from the supply security perspective. And we see batteries, not just a battery and energy provider, it's, it's a national security thing. It's a mission critical for the government to really build this infrastructure. So, so we kind of looking into that and the recyclability, the data part of it. So in principle, all these ingredients looked at from you know basic principles and how we can do better and uh, really showcase it to our first Giga factory that will be built in Nandicott. Uh, 
I, I saw on your slide you that uh, you're you've got a uh, cathode manufacturing partner potentially lined up. Are you at liberty to reveal who that is? Uh, yes, I think it's it's already probably in the news as well. Uh, they are they uh, the company also happened to be a shareholder in the in in Imperia, and it's a local company in in um, you know in Ithaca. It's called Primat Precision Materials, and Primat has been in existence for twenty years uh, because our uh, chemistry is, is our secret sauce. We did not want to give it to someone who we cannot, you know, really believe in or, or rely on. So, uh, so it, I think it, it became a win-win for both the companies. While we always want to promote local companies and Primate will be the best example. Can, can, you, can you please spell the name of that company? Yeah, it's P-R-I-M-E-T, Primate. Okay, thank you very much. That's another, I noticed that there's a, at least one reporter on, on this uh, Zoom meeting. That's another one for you to note down, just a hint. Uh, that's more local content, so thank you. Yes, and, and out of 20, 25 components we use, uh, we are very proud in saying at least four or five of them are coming from the vendors that are already located in the York State. So there is a lot of local content here uh, that you know we are, we are trying to to embed in our ecosystem, and we'll welcome more suppliers. We have you know we have a new uh, actually a supply chain manager. She is every day trying to figure out how we can maximize the local content. So it's it's part of our DNA. We want to be a, a local company and hire as many local people, as many local vendors we can work, and obviously downstream customers also possible. Then we'll we'll focus on that. So uh, with that, I think, uh, you know, we, uh, the good news earlier this year, we were able to close uh, a significant round of funding. Uh, obviously we are running late in, in, in our plan, as you may have seen, we, we, I think in 2018 announced that we'll be in production in 2020, uh, didn't happen. Uh, and, and, you know, we had many challenges, a project like this, uh, you know, obviously we didn't anticipate the issues we'll face and there are some COVID delays. Uh, but, you know, major delay happened in, in, in funding. You know, it's, it's very challenging to convince investors that you can build a business profitably and, and you can manufacture product right here in the U.S. and still build a profitable business. So we, it took us a while, but we really found, you know, a key investor who believed in us, who, who, who share our vision. And, and now we are a fully funded company uh, to at least uh, deliver this first phase, which is one point. Uh, you know, around one gigawatt hour right now. And then eventually we are trying to take it to 32 gigawatt hour in, in coming years. I see there is another question. Uh, do you see yourself getting into large scale grid storage battery system? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we see ourselves in every possible market uh, except the portable electronics, the cell phone and laptop. Uh, we anticipate that, uh, you know, our batteries um, you know, they deserve to be in every possible market, uh, looking at their performance and the other benefits. But, but the grid size, uh, yes, that, that's our sweet spot. We already have about seven to eight containers that each container can be turned into three to five megawatt hour size, depending upon how we design them. Um, so that, uh, you know, once we start production, we actually want to build our, mm -hmm. our own battery and use it ourselves in our own Gigafactory mm -hmm. as a backup. So that will also be a demo battery for our customers, but we want to be the user of our own batteries as well, uh, day one. So, so that's the goal, but uh, you know, yes, that, that's the market we definitely looking into. We have in past worked with the local utility company to do a demonstration project with NYSERDA. We already have another project from DOE right now that is also a public announcement we did last year probably, which is building a hybrid grid in Long Island with our technology, I mean our battery part of it. So along the way, we have done some demonstrations. We have shown how our batteries could be beneficial for the grid integration. And we anticipate that as the large scale production start, uh, we'll do more. Uh, will P series or later series require uh, changes in EV design? 
uh, the answer is no. We are trying to build our technologies more as a drop-in uh, nature. Now, if EV vehicle manufacturer want to change it because they want to, you know, create a smaller housing or different design, I think it will be up to them. But what we are really trying to do is build a design or sell and the factory, the whole design of the factory as well, that we can transition from our N series, some our P series to N series, then eventually S series without much changes. So that um, hopefully will, uh, you know, help. And uh, I know will also allow uh, the faster adoption. So some of the pictures here on the screen showcasing, you know, post our investment, uh, you know, some of the machines that we we will, as you can see, uh, we did some acquisition in past that these are, you know, some of the brand new, they look like brand new equipment that we moved here in Endicott uh, from Michigan and North Carolina. And uh, the team has started, you know, uh, putting them on the floor now. Uh, we are almost 30% done in our progress in terms of the factory setup. So we're making month-to-month uh, -month progress. There are no delays. There are no, uh, you know, bottlenecks so far. And uh, the growth plan, you know, we basically uh, looking at uh, scaling the capacity. Um, you know, this slide probably showcasing how from one to five to 11 gigawatt hour in phase two will be, uh, you know, scaling with our P series and N series. And as the S series develops, that will be integrated and become part of our 32, uh, you know, gigawatt hour vision or even 50 gigawatt if, if industry need 50. And uh, we don't see any reason why we won't be able to, you know, scale with the pace of the industry. So, so we will be fully ready to, to adopt that. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is the team that is uh, pulling it through. You, you already uh, saw some of uh, the background I share on the on the team. And uh, here's the contact information. Uh, we are based out of Endicott. Uh, Paul, uh, who is with me right here, his email and phone number is, is mentioned. Uh, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions, concerns. Uh, hopefully at uh, the right time, once the factory is built, uh, we will be able to uh, demonstrate some of these uh, uh, cells in, in person when you know, such meetings will be organized uh, uh, you know, for, for our future interactions. So um, any more questions, happy to take them now. <clears throat> okay, uh, just, I'm just curious, roughly how many employees do you have now? And I think you're, you're previous slide here said that you've got a growth plan to get to 11 gigawatt hours per year production around 2026 if I read the slide correctly mm -hmm. uh, and then what might be your direct employment at that point yeah so uh, in next at one gigawatt hour which will be next 12 to 18 month we anticipate around 150 direct job which also lead to probably close to 200 indirect jobs as well. Um, and that's our phase phase one. The phase two 11 gigawatt hour would be, you know, it's, it's around 150 to 200 people gigawatt per gigawatt hour. So we anticipate around 1,000 to 1,500 employees at that point at 11 gigawatt hour. And eventually uh, somewhere around 2,500 or so uh, as we head uh, to the larger scale, because uh, you know, if we scale it same place, same roof, then the scale is not really linear. But um, but that gives you ballpark numbers. Yeah. Very good. And and and, uh, and about now, do you can you say how many employees do you have right right this mo moment? Yeah. So including our R and D and the manufacturing, I would say in the ballpark of fifty. So it's a, it's a yeah. Good Five number. zero. Yes. Five, five zero. Okay. That's well, that's, that's more than I would have guessed. So that that's your, your, you're on your way then. That's, that's very good. That's difficult to hire good people too. That it, it takes time to convince people that you've got, you know, a, a, you know, really get them to believe what you have coming here. And if you're looking for the top notch people, that it's going to take some time. So, and, and uh, that's good news. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, and we, we have been working with uh, local uh, universities, colleges like Broome Community College, uh, SUNY Binghamton, 
to come up with courses, you know, modules, internship where we can, you know, build programs to train workforce yeah, and, 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 you know, bring really local capabilities on the training side. We also working with another company to build AI and, you know, augmented reality tools where training can be done in a virtual environment, giving them 3D feel and, you know, uh, before we put them on the manufacturing floor. So there are a lot that is happening on the workforce development, training, internships, uh, because we really want to hire as many local uh, talent as possible. And obviously, BU graduates, that comes with a lot of lithium and battery knowledge as well. So. Um, and of course, the senior management we are bringing from uh, outside as it is necessary to bring that expertise uh, as, you know, these uh, top leadership have been in the industry for a long time and they are needed to train the next uh, level of workforce. I will, I will also invite our CEO now to join us because I had him waiting for the Q&A session, although we did a lot of Q&A already, but... Uh, He's right here, so Chaitanya, if you want to yeah, come. I, I can stand here. Yeah, take a seat. I don't know if Hi, you can Mr. see him, yes. but uh, he's right here now. So uh, I saw a couple of questions here in the chat. I don't know if you see the chat. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah one chat. thing that they're asking about uh, is, are there safeguards against somebody potentially stealing your, your internet? intellectual property and your your processing methods and, and technology that type of thing and i i guess part of part of it is probably going to be people have to sign non-disclosure agreements but anyway go, please go ahead and answer that question yeah so i mean non-disclosure agreements are definitely there but our core technology which i'm sure shilesh and paul must have done a good job but it's around the biomineralization and actually the, the patent that we have, uh, it's called a composition of matter patent, which is uh, the, the rarer kind of patents that you can get. So I think there's you know design patents, utility patents, but uh, about 0.5% of the ones out there amongst millions are composition of matter patents. These are usually for like pharmaceuticals. So in, in a way, it means that we own the molecule. This is, this is ours. And so because we have that, we have a, a certain spectroscopy that we can run on any cell. And within 15 seconds, we can detect if uh, there is a patent infringement, as in if somebody is using our molecule inside their cells. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that is the protection that we have and we can very quickly figure out if, um, if you know, there is any, any infringements. Um, outside of that, I think there's definitely the patent world, but lots of you know know-how, and we uh, we have whatever we have publicly available in our patents, but our know-how protects um, our secrets. Uh, they are only with us, and so it's not not super easy to uh, to copy and replicate. I see another question in here. What interest have you received from the auto industry? And I think Chaitanya is probably pretty well equipped to answer that one right now. So uh, you yeah, want to take that I one can, too? Yeah. I mean, uh, we see deep interest from the auto industry. Um, so the P series cell that uh, that I'm sure we have spoken about, and then we have the N series. So um, at the moment, I would say the N series, uh, at least you know, traditionally for the last five seven years, it is what the auto industry has been very interested in. However, uh, because of a couple of reasons, a the shortage of nickel and cobalt generally in the world, but also understanding the fact that the P series or phosphate cells, which in the market you get LFP more, but such cells, when they come to the pack level, I think the gap that, that they had in terms of their energy density between a nickel and phosphate cell, it, it, due to a simplified pack, the, the gap sort of narrows. And so for reference, uh, you know, an, an N-series cell in a Tesla car can give you maybe 300 miles of range. A phosphate cell today can give you 220. However, I think they're starting to make up the gap some with, with simpler designs. So you might be able to get about 240 <laughs> miles or so. And so uh, the auto industry is actually, for those reasons, very interested in, in exploring, you know, utilizing phosphate cells and companies like Tesla and Volkswagen have already made big announcements uh, around that. Uh, our chemistry, uh, which I'm sure we have covered, is, is even better than the LFP chemistry. We get another 20% boost in our energy density. So let's say if the pack level LFP cell was offering 240 in my example, 
n series was was 300 we might be somewhere around the 270 mile range and so that becomes more interesting for auto players to explore so with our singular cell design we can cater to both energy storage which in my mind is a complete slam dunk lfp chemistry is right now ruling that market and we are better in the phosphate family so that's a slam dunk but even the auto industry is showing deep interest i'd also take another two seconds and add i know usually when we talk auto industry it's easy and, and simpler to think like the car but there are other automobiles right there are the trucks and buses they don't have the same space constraint as a car and so those um, applications tend to value the safety and lower cost and the longer cycle life that the phosphate cells offer and so they are, are even more interested in in phosphate chemistries in general and, and definitely in our chemistry the other thing too is the uh once you reach more than 400 watt hours per kilogram in energy density, I saw an earlier slide where you had your, your uh, advanced solid or all solid state battery uh, uh, in your road technology roadmap. Yeah. Aviation becomes, long distance aviation becomes more doable. That's, that's kind of the, the, the threshold is 400 watt hours per kilogram. And you were, you were in your slide, you were talking that you might be able to get 450 watt hours per kilogram. So that would be a, a great achievement. Absolutely, that's spot on. Um, solid state, I think would definitely open up electric aviation and, and many other applications, but, but that I think would be a, a prime one, one look. One other thing I want to mention too, or ask, ask about is energy storage at, at grid scale. Uh, one of the things that they're looking for is longer term. In other words, the current lithium ion batteries that are typically offered for grid scale applications that have been used for a, a, you know, a handful of years now, there's a few companies doing this. They are typically about four to eight hours of storage. Would your chemistry and packaging methods be able to provide days maybe weeks of storage without too much loss of, of energy? Uh, and and uh, would, would it be cost effective and practical? Yeah, yeah, I can answer that. So, I mean, in principle, yes. So technically, uh, where we are today, uh, even I think we have submitted proposal all the way to 16, 20 hours already. So days uh, storage is not a challenge. The self-discharge, which is primarily you want to retain the capacity, is also very strong. It's less than you know one percent a month um, right now, and we're trying to improve it further. So it, it could be you know a few weeks back up, few months back up without sacrificing a lot of energy. Uh, however, when it comes to daily use and very large size like gigawatt hour sizes, uh, the cost still need to come down, and this is one of the goal. You know, one of the best way to drive the cost down is to really increase the volume and the, achieve the scale of economy. Uh, and that's why we want to do like 32 or 50, 60, wherever the industry takes us. Um, but other than that, the cost aspect, uh, the performance wise, uh, I think we, we, we make a lot of uh, good sense in, in long term storage market as well. Thank you. That's also good news because if if you're losing, I, I didn't catch what you said, 1% per week, is that what you said, or month? Per month. Uh, per month. Yes. That's, that's very low loss. So that, that's, that's good too. Is that much better than other existing chemistries or, or is it not that much different? No, I think it's much better. I think I would say at least, at least 50 to 60% better than what I've seen best in the industry. And one of the reasons we, 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 we have that is uh, if you look at the, the voltage profile of our cells, uh, our, we delivered the highest voltage in the industry. Uh, but not only that, which is 3.9 volt, the other chemistry, the you know, other two chemistries I spoke about, one delivers 3.2 volt and the other one is 3.7. So we are 3.9, but not, not only the 3.9, it's majority, like 70 to 80% of our capacity is, is at that higher voltage range you know, around 4 to 4, 3.9. So the discharge, to self-discharge is very minimal in that range. And it retains that high voltage and, and which is in principle very, very attractive because you don't have to complicate your electronics to measure the losses. But also as you need to, let's say, suddenly drag a lot of power, 
uh, you don't have to do instantly many calculations to deliver the right amount of current because your voltage is constant. So you know what current you need to meet that power and don't have to run into a situation where voltage is dropping very fast, which is what happens in NMC chemistry. So you have to calculate both and that makes instant power a little difficult because you know calculations cannot be run that fast as, as fast as you need the energy. So, so that's kind of one of the benefits. Um, and I think we are better than many other chemistries there. Very good, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions, anything they're worried about, or uh, perhaps uh, didn't catch that uh, you might want to uh, mention or ask about? Okay, I, I, I wanna ask one, maybe a couple more comments. One, one was my wife. Uh, she's thinking about children, and you mentioned a little bit about this too. What might they want to focus on, say, in high school before they go to college, and then possibly what major? And it, it, you probably have multiple specialties because this is a niche application. So there isn't really a degree probably that focuses specifically on trying to help a company that makes lithium ion batteries, but probably more than one. But please elaborate what you think is, is a good thing for people to, to, to uh, focus on in, in high school and in college. Yeah, I can answer that. Maybe Chatanay can add on that. So, you know, as you rightly mentioned, this, although it's a niche market, but it's very, the skill set you need also very diverse. So we have, you know, in, in our current 50 people team that I spoke about R&D and manufacturing, we have, uh, we have employees with the mechanical engineering background, electrical, electronics, power electronics, industrial engineering, software, material science, which include chemistry, physics, geology, uh, yeah, right? yeah Geo mining, mining yeah. yes. So these are nine, 10 streams that I can think of with a great future in batteries. And of course, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, these are some evolving uh, industries. Um, I don't know if I missed any important, um, you know, I think course, you, but. Yeah, I think you covered it all, but it's basically, you know, it's based on very fundamental science. So in high school, of course, you have at some point separation between physics, chemistry, or whatever, but a, a deep focus on science, um, I think in this industry would, would definitely go a long way. And, and I would add here uh, to people that, are maybe good with people and good at public speaking, uh, good at letter writing, good at advertising, people that are interested in sales and marketing, if you can combine an interest and some background in technology with marketing and, and the effective technical writing and in writing uh, simplified and to engage people's attention as well, you've got a career for this as well. So uh, please don't, uh, you know, skip that either. Yeah, yeah. and Paul can speak to that. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> thank, I, I thank group. you very much for that. Val. <laughs> <laughs> I think of a better person to talk about that. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll send you the check later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, one other thing, I, this has come up before, and I, I don't want to... Uh, say anything that might uh, alert somebody to something that, but just to alleviate somebody that might be thinking about this from an earlier thing that local people went through. Uh, when you're storing your, your finished product uh, or even in your manufacturing process, uh, like when you do formation that we're actually kind of like making the batteries, the chemistry start working, uh, do you have? A, are you going to be having an automated fire suppression system that's appropriate for putting out lithium-ion batteries, even though the, your your chemistry is is safer and less likely to have thermal runaway? Yes, yes of course. That's of course. part of our. You know, safety is the prime and foremost thing for us. Uh, safety of our people on floor, the community. You know, everything. We we had one of the best engineering firm to to do it probably costing us double the, the other engineering firms would have delivered this project, uh, but we, we didn't want to compromise on the safety aspect. 
So, so that's going to be our, our always our focus. And, uh, uh, and, you know, there are various along the way in the process, as well as how we store the batteries, everything, multi-layer, you know, safety mechanism that, you know, you will see. Uh, and we can talk about it at, at some point in detail if necessary, you know, even include our quality control and safety guys. Uh, but this is, this is something no compromise for us. Very good. Thank you. Is there anything that you might be looking for from the community or from local uh, government officials or even state level officials that would help you beyond what you the help that you've already gotten? Um, I, I think I think wherever whenever we needed help, we received it. At this point, our primary I would say goal is to really get this factory off the ground. So next six months, I would say, are very, very important. And we really want to remain focused on this delivery of the first Giga factory. But as we reach that goal, I think we want to start talking about the scale up here. And in that, we we'll need support from community, from government, you know, local business people. Uh, because once we have demonstrated it, I think it will be a good proof of everything end to end, from molecules to machine to market. And, and then it will be scale up primarily driven by people's effort. And, and there we'll need a lot of support. So we will uh, we'll, we'll hopefully host this similar meeting in the future and, and ask for help. Um, but so far we have received all the help we needed. So we really much appreciate. And also thank you for, for inviting us today. And I think this was a good opportunity for us to, to interact with the intellectuals that really understand the science technology, but also can translate our language in, in the community in a better way uh, and, and maybe, you know, make our product project more um, likable to the community and people should join us, you know, in many ways as, a, as, a, as, a, as their career, you know, as their learning platform, uh, you know, even buy batteries from us. We want, uh, you know, nearby homes to be powered by our batteries and solar eventually. So really appreciate that, you know, for you to, to, uh, invite us first and also, you know, giving us this platform. Th thank you for, uh, for attending. I want to give one last opportunity. Anybody in the audience, especially members of the press, if you're still with us, do you have any questions? You've, you've got the, the experts right here ready to answer. So there is one more question that came in. Uh, who built the production machinery that is on the floor already? So, you know, this kind of, because of the different processes and we spoke about the expertise we need, chemical engineering, mechanical, electrical, power electronics, that kind of reflects on the production floor. So there is no single company that manufacture equipments for a gigafactory. So we have at least 15 vendors involved. Uh, the good news is majority of our vendors are either US or European. Um, which means majority of the equipment supply chain is also, you know, X, X Asia, which is very strong for us because, you know, I think, I think we need to build this industry, uh, you know, and, and come up with, with more supply chain and friendly supply chain. So there's no specific one single company. And I, I don't think we are able to disclose the company names in the public setting just because of our agreements with them and the non-disclosure nature of our arrangements. But what we can assure you is, you know, they are all top-notch companies in, in their respective areas, and there are at least 15 of them. So hope that answered, not completely, but hopefully fairly okay to your satisfaction. Thank you. I have a question. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi, this is Gay at ETM Solar Works. Uh, how how do you uh, see the workforce? You know, do you feel like we have a decent workforce now and in the future to serve the needs of this new factory? Take it first. Well, I can take it first. Yeah, so I think that is a good question. Uh, as uh, we have been alluding to, there's different kinds of people that we're looking for, uh, both skilled and semi-skilled workforce. Uh, we need tons of engineers of, of different kinds, and that reflects even in the 
the factory technicians. So I think this place in general has offered a good breadth of different kinds of skill sets. And so thus far, we've been very, uh, very fortunate to be able to tap into that. Um, I also believe that we have, um, so our, our HR director, she's been working with local uh, schools, uh, Sunny Bloom and, and uh, Binghamton universities to, uh, to develop, you know, programs which can allow us to continue to foster uh, the workforce locally that we can then bring on to our factory floor. So I think thus far, given, given the breadth of workforce, uh, skill workforce that you already have through different industries that have existed, as um, has been quite beneficial to us. And if we need to add something. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think on the, in the call also we have Adam Adam Flint who has yeah. been a great support to us in terms of spreading words and providing platform and connections to you know look into how what can be done and how and different programs we can adopt to uh, to to improve the skill sets and you know workforce uh, training program. Mm -hmm. uh, and as rightly mentioned by Chetanya, you know our head of our supply chain is a local person. Head of our human resources, local the engineers, couple of engineers we've hired. Um, the finance, you know, whole team is actually local right now. So there's a lot that already exists in the region, you know, from Raymond to solar companies to BAE system, Lockheed Martin, Corning, I3. then hmm? I3. Yeah, the I three electronics here before. Then you know, in Rochester, Syracuse area, you know, from Kodak to Xerox, old those those you know that that workforce that existed at some point. We hired a lot of folks from there as well in the, in the region. So it's a rich region, but yes, there are challenges. I think uh, we have tried to figure out how we can solve those challenges in short term, but we need to do a lot more uh, as our needs are going to be much more intense in the next three to five, 10 year time frame. So we are trying to prepare ourselves for that and let's see what happens. Any other questions? Well, I guess I really, really, want to thank all three of you for participating in this presentation and uh, most of all to Dr. Rupretti for all of the research that you have done for so many years and for uh, filing for many of these patents, maybe even almost all of them, I'm not sure, but uh, and for organizing and being the driving force to make this company happen right here in Endicott and for for explaining to us that it has a lot of New York content, a lot of North American content, and, and uh, a lot of European content as well. So it's going to help avoid some of the potential supply chain problems that we're experiencing now, uh, because this is energizing su suppliers that have been kind of overlooked because of the big players that have been concentrating where they're getting their materials and, and their components from. So that's going to improve things for the United States. As you mentioned, for military security, that's an important thing as well. And most of all, what I care about, and for I would suspect most of the people that are members of this audience here tonight, uh, and those that will see this recording in the future, we deeply care about the environment. And we know that climate change is our overriding problem that is globally needs to be solved by cooperation and by by harnessing the right uh you know synergy between government and industry uh, and using the right people with the right skill sets we can make this you know world a better place even if we happen to be wrong about climate change, I don't think we are. I, I think that question is incontrovertible. Climate change is an accelerating problem. We've got greenhouse gas emissions that are still accelerating. We haven't even flattened them out. But this company, I'm gonna reiterate, this is a big deal. This is, this is gonna send ripples across the, the, uh, the global, uh, you know, uh, the global pond, so to speak, of, of what's happening in terms of moving the needle in the right direction, in, in terms of helping to transition our economy to renewable energy, and that will help save a habitable climate. And I want to thank you and Dr. Rupretti and all the members of your team, as well as all the people that helped you, even the, your professor back in India. So, and, you know, all the way back to, to uh, Dr. Whittingham, too, who probably isn't with us on this this uh, meeting, but he's he's here in spirit. And, and uh, 
I, I'm sure he's going to smile when he sees this. So thank you very much. Thank you again for thank having you. us.